Good afternoon, church family and friends. We would like to welcome you here to Philadelphia SDA Church here in San Antonio, Texas. I hope you are ready to worship with us this morning. Um, if, if you're on right now, we'd like for you to let your friends, family know um, to tune in right now. Because God's about to work in this place, and I don't want you to miss out. Uh, we're going to move on to our praise and worship. First song says, Lord, you're awesome.
of Aaron to pray for us all. Pray with me, please. Father in heaven, praise, glory, and honor to you. Power and glory for you are omnipotent. You declare your love for us in the morning and you 
show your faithfulness every night as we bed down. Father, we are in need for your divine pain medicine this morning. So we humbly, Father, declare that Jesus is our Lord and our Savior. We claim his blood of righteousness because we have none of our own. And so, Father, forgive us for any sins we may have on your holy books. That when you look at them, you see Jesus and not us. Father, we petition you as we ask for mercy and kindness and more love from you. There are so many of us within our congregation who are healing because of surgeries. We have those who have lost loved ones. And we call upon the Holy Spirit that he would provide the comfort that Jesus declared he would provide. Father, we claim any prosperity that you have for any of us. Don't make us wait. We claim any change in our character and our nature to follow after Jesus. We claim this today. Make us whole. Make us holy. Make us righteous. Give us the character that would fit us for heaven and the new earth. Because as you have stated, sin will not rise again. So we want to be with you, Lord. We want to stand on the sea of glass we want to have a white robe. We want to have palms in our hands. We want to take our crowns, the ones that you give us, and lay them at your feet, oh Lord. This is our desire. Please, Father, save us from this world. It is rocking and rolling and it's upside down with so much contamination and wickedness and evilness and hatefulness. We want to get out of here quick, fast, and in a hurry. So, Father, save us because we can't save ourselves. We claim all these blessings and favors that you have for us in the name of Jesus. And so as your manservant comes before us, O oh Lord, Use his mouth and reveal to him the holy things that you have on your desk. And that as we hear them, that we will internalize them and make it part of our life. That we will be changed. Thank you, O oh Lord, for offering us salvation as a gift we thank you we praise you we worship you and we offer you our loyalty and our devotion and our worship in Jesus name we worship you amen Everyone, it's Aunt Frenita. Today's story is called The Parable of the Great Beast. The memory verse is from Luke chapter 14, verse 15. It says, Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Today's message is Jesus invites us to be with him in heaven. Jesus told a story once about someone who had prepared a great feast. 
When the feast was ready, he sent to call the guest. Find out what happened and what it could mean for us. Once, Jesus and his disciples were having a meal at someone's house, and Jesus told this story. A man gave a big banquet and invited many people, Jesus began. When it was time to eat, the man sent his servant to tell the guests, Come, everything is ready. But all the guests said that they could not come. Each man made an excuse. The first one said, I have just bought a land, and I must go look at it. Please excuse me. Another man said, I have just bought five pairs of oxen. I must go try them. Please excuse me. A third man said, I just got married. I can't come. So the servant returned. He told his master what had happened. Then the master became angry and said, Go at once into the streets and the alleys of the town. Bring in the poor, the cripple, the blind, and the lame. Later the servant said to him, Master, I did what you told me to do, but we still have places for more people. The master said to the servant, Go out into the roads and country lanes. Tell the people there to come. I want my house to be full. None of those men that I invited first will ever eat with me. Jesus was talking about himself in this parable. He is like the man who planned the party and invited many people. Jesus has invited everyone to accept his salvation, which leads to eternal life. And he's giving you an invitation. Many people in the story had excuses for not coming to the party. They let other things become more important than being with their friend. They weren't really true friends at all. Because they were too busy with things, they turned down the invitation and missed the great feast. In this parable, the invitation to the banquet is Jesus' invitation for us to accept his salvation. Accepting salvation means that we ask Jesus to forgive our sins and choose to do the things he wants us to do. We have a choice. We can decide to accept his invitation or to let other things become more important in our lives. How about you? Right now, will you say yes to the invitation Jesus has given you? Do you want to be with him in heaven and experience the joy of being in his presence forever?
God is great and greatly to be praised. God is great and greatly to be praised. God is great and greatly to be praised. Praise God is an awesome God. Somebody give God some praise in here. Get a praise team. See the mask. God is so good. God is so great. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Philadelphia SDA Church. Philadelphia Seventh Day Adventist Church. Somebody ought to give God some praise here today. Let's stay in a season of prayer, Father table is set. We've already started worship. We just pray that you will continue to pour into us a message that you have uniquely designed just for us to touch us and move us. We thank you. We love you. We give you all the praise, glory, and honor. We ask it in Jesus' name. Let everyone, everyone say amen and amen. did that so my wife could laugh at me. Hi, gorgeous. 
family, today's message is entitled, No Matter What. No matter what. <sighs> you know it's interesting when you're a parent and your kids are very unique. Each kid, I have three children, two beautiful girls, one handsome boy, and each kid has uh, unique circumstances. Each kid comes out a little bit, not a little bit, a lot different from the other children. So our son is a lover of music. He, and in, when he was in daycare, he was about one years old, and you know, they play music for the kids to go to sleep. And while they were playing the music for the kids to go to sleep, he was up. And when my wife and I went to the school and they said, your son, he seems to always be up. And we said, well, what is he doing? They said, well, he's every, the music is playing in the background. And while everyone's sleeping, he's humming. I'm like, what? And I'm looking at him, little Mike, what are you doing? He likes the music. We are a musical home. And then Michelle, that's our middle child, that's our, our, our first daughter, she has a lover, she is a lover of questions. She's always asking questions. You can tell her anything, and it's daddy, why? Mommy, why? She questions and questions and questions. And then our baby girl, Marcel, Ellie. Now, my wife noticed something when she was 11 months. She just turned a year old in August. My wife noticed something. She said, wait a minute. Baby, there's something unique about her. Why isn't she bearing weight on her legs? I said, I, I, I didn't notice. I, I didn't notice. She said, yeah, our kids, the other two kids at this point, we're already bearing weight on her legs. She can't really stand. So I have a tendency to, at times, think my wife is overreacting. So I'm like, baby, stop. She's just different and unique. But lo and behold, we took her to the doctor, and the doctor said she may have rickets. What is rickets? So... We looked it up, and rickets is caused by a vitamin D deficiency. It's basically your bones are too weak. And so I was wrong to just minimize it. So the uniqueness of my baby girl is she couldn't bear weight on her legs. She can't bear weight on her legs. And in this moment... We are now in a perilous time because, see, it's not like just not being able to sing, well, singing too much while you're in daycare or asking a lot of questions. Now this one is a little bit more painful. This uniqueness um, does something to us. This feels like we're in a battle because this was not the design. And so as I'm looking at my baby girl, my beautiful little girl, and she stands and tries to, but her knees buckle, I, 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 my emotions come over me. I don't know what to do. Why am I in this situation? Why my baby girl has to suffer in this way? Why can't she stand the way everyone else stands? I'm in this moment. We're in this moment. And it reminded me of the, prop, the prophet Habakkuk. The prophet Habakkuk, for some context, this is one of what's known as the minor prophets. Minor only not in stature, but in the amount of literature we have in our Bible. So the prophet Habakkuk is uh, prophesying in a time known as the pre-exilic period. This is a period between 641 uh, B.C. to 598 B.C. It could be during the latter 
portion of the reign of Josiah or the first four years of the reign of Jehoiakim. So there's this unique little period. So it's about 702 years in between the exodus. The exodus is when the children of Israel were in captivity. Uh, the Hebrews were in captivity for 400 years by the Egyptians, and they were let go. God saved them. God took them out of that situation. And when God took them out of that situation, he established his theocracy. In other words, he established his government over them. But there are many nations around the children of Israel. There are many outside forces. They are not out of the woods. They wandered in the wilderness because they could not make it to Canaan. They did too many bad things. But there was so much going on around them that even when God took them out of a situation, it seems like they walked back into another one. It seems like they had another issue, another problem. How, how is it that God gets you out of one problem and it seems like God get no, it seems like you get your, I'm talking to someone. It seems like you get yourself into another problem. God gets you out of one, you get yourself into another one. The children of Israel are now surrounded by different enemies, and one particular enemy is the Chaldeans, also the master class of the Babylonians. And so the prophet Habakkuk is here. And remember, prophets, uh, their main objective was to speak about God. They were to proclaim what God is doing in their lives. But most importantly, they would admonish the people. They would tell the people what you guys have been doing wrong. But unique about this prophet is because this prophet does something a little bit different. Instead of telling the people what they're doing wrong on behalf of God, he does something else. But rather than me ramble on and on and on, let's hear what God's word says. And we're getting ready to do battle. And so soldiers, you need your weaponry. So soldiers in God's army, unsheath your swords and grab your Bibles. Turn with me to the book Habakkuk. The book Habakkuk. The book of Habakkuk. Chapter 1. Chapter 1. And again, our message is entitled, No Matter What no matter what. Chapter 1. Chapter 1, Habakkuk chapter 1, we're going to read verse 2 through 4. And the word of God said this, O Lord, how long shall I cry and you will not hear, even cry out to you, violence, and you will not save why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention arises. Therefore, the law is powerless and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, perverse judgment proceeds. Our first point. Why is the companion of pain? Why is the close companion of pain? Habakkuk, different than other prophets, different than Isaiah, different than Jeremiah, Habakkuk is not speaking to the people on behalf of God. Habakkuk is speaking to God on behalf of the people. He is crying out saying, God, we are in this situation. Why are we here? Why does it seem that those Chaldeans, those bad people, those who are not with you, why does it seem like that they are trampling over the righteous, as verse 4 says? Why does it seem like they're getting away with murder? Why in this turmoil, why in this pain, why in this racial oppression, why, in, 
I walked in. Why in this coronavirus situation? Why in this bad relationship situation? Why does it seem like the enemy is getting the power over me? Why did someone who has, if I'm just being gentle, racial epithets, how did that person become a president? Yeah, we, listen, we're going to be real about the situation. Why is it that that person can brag about their uh, quote-unquote healing from the coronavirus, but my family member had to die or my family member had to get sick? How is it that it seems like People who are not righteous or do unrighteous things, how are they flourishing in the midst of our suffering? Habakkuk is asking the question, why are they allowed to trample over us? Why are they allowed to be successful against us, but we serve you? Where is your justice, God? Again, he is in between when they're about to be captured, they're about to go into captivity. I'm just skipping ahead for a little bit just to give you the backdrop. They're going into captivity. But before then, in this moment, before they get to this moment, they had already been in captivity for 400 years. Habakkuk is asking, Lord, why? Haven't we suffered enough? Why? Haven't we been through... Um, 246 years of chattel slavery in this country? Didn't we go through 100 years of Jim and Jane Crow? Why are we still in this moment where knees are on our necks? Why are we still in this moment when there's no justice for a woman that's killed? Innocently in her home. Why are we still in this moment where we can't peacefully protest? Why are we still here? Why does it seem like those around us who would mean to harm us are successful? Why are they getting over? And Habakkuk is seeing this situation and he asks why. Family, in those perilous situations, you will be prompted to ask why. You will say, why is this happening? You will look up at God and say, God, what are you doing? If you don't believe in God, you're still going to ask why. Oh, did you get, if you even don't believe in God, if you have a scintilla of belief, but more so you don't believe, you will still ask why. You will still say, I've done everything right at work. I showed up on time. I, I made sure to do all my work and I still got fired. Why? I've done everything in this relationship I was supposed to do. I made sure I cooked the food. I made sure I washed the clothes. I made sure I did everything I was supposed to do. Why did he still cheat on me? Why does she still treat me this way? After all that I've done, I'm asking why. Why am I still in this situation? Why do they get to survive? Why do they get to enjoy the fruits of their deceit? <laughs> Help me on this one. Why? And if you are not challenged by a why in your perilous situation, then is it actually a perilous situation for you? You may just enjoy it. Oh, man. You may enjoy the suffering that you see others. In a couple of weeks ago, we talked about this suffering, this willingness to be okay with the, ang with the suffering of others. Are the Chaldeans like this? I believe that is what Habakkuk is saying. He's saying, Lord, not only are these your people, not only do they love you, but Lord, these people don't love you. These people are taking pleasure in our suffering, your people's suffering. Why, Lord, why? Where is your justice? No, where is your justice? It's been seven months, and I still have to deal with this coronavirus. Lord, where's your justice? I've served you all night. I've prayed all night. I've said, Lord, get rid of the coronavirus. I said I don't want to deal with it anymore, and it's still here. Where's your justice? Where is it? This is what's called the lament. When the prophet or the man or woman of God begins to cry out, and they lament. 
So I is the companion of faith. But notice something in verse 6. Verse 6 says, For indeed I am raising up the Chaldeans, a bitter and hasty nation which marches through the breadth of the earth to possess dwelling places that are not theirs. Did you hear that? Let me go back. I am raising up the Chaldeans. Hold on. Habakkuk is saying, wait, what? I'm complaining about what they're doing to us. I'm wondering why they are torturing us. And you telling me you raising them up? Nah, bro, you bugging. You bugging. That's how he's thinking. That's how he's speaking to God. He is saying, Lord, stop it. Stop playing with me. Stop playing with me. You are raising them up. Look at what the text says. I am raising them up to possess dwelling places that are not theirs. To possess dwelling. So our second point. You may not always like the answers to your why. Uh-oh. Yeah, you may not like the answers to your why. He asked the Lord, what is going on? Why is this happening to us? Why are we suffering? The Lord responds and said, guess what? I'm rising them up against you. What? I am, that's what the text is saying. I am rising them up against you, against your people. That's what's going to happen. And so there are moments where your why, the answer, you don't like it. You don't like the answer because you've asked why. Be careful when you ask questions. Be careful what you wish for. If you ask why, be okay with whatever answer God gives you. Imagine God telling you that. Imagine you're at work doing everything you're supposed to do. Some person at your job is evil and mean to you. And you say, why are they doing this to me, Lord? Why? I've done everything nice. I've said hi and everything. But why are they being so mean to me? And the Lord responds and says, well, they are mean, but they're going to get the promotion and then they're going to be your manager. What? What do you mean they're going to be? I, Lord, did you hear what I just said? You didn't hear what I said. They're being mean to me. They're not serving you. They're serving themselves. So I, I'm confused. Why are they doing it? Well, why is because I'm going to raise them up again. What does that have to do with anything, Lord? What does that have to do with anything? Why are you raising them up? Aren't you supposed to smite them? This is the time where the, the prophet is saying, get rid of them. We remember Jonah. Jonah famously is another prophet. He's a prophet of God and God sends him to Nineveh. Jonah doesn't want to go to Nineveh. He doesn't want the Ninevites to be saved. He thinks they're too bad, and he doesn't want them to be saved. And so when he gets to Nineveh, he hides and waits and watches to see if God will destroy them. Habakkuk has this same sentiment. He's saying, no, Lord, they're bad. I don't like them. You shouldn't like them. Destroy them. Why haven't you finished them yet? And God responds and says, well, actually, they're bad, but... They're going to overtake you guys at some point. What? Yes, they're going to overtake you guys at some point. At some point, your why may not be the answer you were looking for. The answer to your why may not be what you're looking for. Does this mean the, uh, the, does this mean the pandemic was God's plan? When some of you were praying... And asking God for deliverance from the diseases, and then a pandemic came. I'm not saying it is God's plan. But what I'm saying is there are times in your life, it, there, there are situations that you're asking why to. Situations where you want an answer. Situations where you're saying something better must happen. These are the situations in your life. And the answer you get, the response you get, may not be the response that you were looking for. It may be a response that uh, actually makes you even more mad. A response that actually puts you in more peril, puts you in more sadness, puts you in more disappointment. Are there moments in your life where you've looked for the response and all you got was another slap in the face? Another slap in the face. It feels like God didn't answer at all. It, this ain't the answer I wanted, therefore it's not an answer. I don't want this answer. This can't be the why. My wife, when we, when we moved to Michigan, 
she had she had still kept her job in New York, and um, she was able to transfer. But they told her that they wanted her to uh, to change and work with another client. And she said the obvious question: Why? Why I'm doing pretty good where I'm at? Why? And the answer was, um, guess what? We're going to send you somewhere where you got to travel really far. Wait, what? I'm in a new state. I just said, I, why? I can stay where I'm at. First of all, why are you changing me? Second of all, why are you sending me somewhere where I got to drive two and a half hours? Two and a half hours from home? Why do I have to go through this? Why? Um, but you needed to move, and you got what you wanted, you got an opportunity to keep your job, but guess what happens? You still got to do something else. The answer you wanted may not be the answer you'll get. Oh, man, somebody needed to hear that. The answer you want may not be the answer you get. Habakkuk wanted God to respond to his first lament, God, why are they doing it? He wanted a response of, well, I'm going to destroy all of them. He wanted that immediate response. But notice what God says in the text. God says, I am rising up the Chaldeans. Bad things happening to people are never God's plan. Let me take a sip before I repeat that. Because you, you needed to hear that. Bad things happening to people are never God's plan. God does not desire for us to suffer, to be in pain, to deal with this turmoil, to deal with asking why all the time. God wants us to be fruitful and merry. God wants us to be happy. But notice there is a situation that has transpired. Sin has created a situation where you do not get <laughs> the happy ending just yet. Keep going in the text. Uh, verse chapter 2, Habakkuk chapter 2, 2 through 4, 2 through, two through 4. Notice what the text says. Because this is after, and now the prophet asks a second question in verse 12. He asks another question, is, is his love not everlasting? He's asking the second question. And then God responds in chapter 2. Notice what God's response is. It, chapter 2, 2 through 4, it says, Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on the tablets that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Behold. The proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. Notice what the text says. It says, for, verse 3, for the vision is yet for an appointed time. Guess what? Third point. <laughs> you got to wait. Let me let that sit there for a minute. You have to wait. You have to to wait. In your circumstance, you have to wait. So God is now explaining to Habakkuk, these, yes, these evil people, these Chaldeans, yes, they're going to rule over in a later date. And, and it's, it's, this is not uncommon for God. In Isaiah chapter 10, verse 2, uh, God speaks to, through the prophet and says the Assyrians will be his mighty arm against his people to punish them. So this is not uncommon. And so God tells Habakkuk that in this situation, these people around you are going to rule for a little bit longer uh, over you. That the bad things are going to keep happening. Oh, man. The bad things are going to keep happening, but. Praise the Lord for a God that has a but. A God that puts, a God that has a but. A God that puts the but in between the sentence, but until an appointed time. That means you have to wait. You have to wait. You have to. I know you don't want to. I know it's, for us, we need instant gratification. That is the world we live in now. That's why we Google everything. Any question we have, we Google and then get the answer. We want the answer now. For, forget like reading a book and like actually studying to find an answer. No, we need instant gratification. Uh, I have a question about the moon and the stars. 
Google moon and stars. <laughs> and then try to get a quick answer. Nah, you may have to study astrology. You may have to read a book about astrology. Uh, uh, go figure. But we're so obsessed because of our smartphones that make us dumb. We're so obsessed. We're trying to get quick things. We're trying to get quick answers. God tells the, the man of God to tell to his people, y'all going to wait a little bit, man. Nah, y'all waiting a little bit. You got to wait. You got to wait. God tells him in the text that he's going to take care of them, that he's eventually going to deal with the Chaldeans. But he lets Habakkuk know about the principle of patience. The character of God requires patience. Isn't God patient with you? What are the things you've been doing this past week? What are the things you're doing right now under the sound of my voice? What are the thoughts going in your mind? that are not of God, but God still says, I'm going to be patient. I'll wait till an appointed time. I'll wait. I'll be patient with you, even though you're not patient with me. Even though you're not patient with me, I'll still be patient with you. But God is telling the man of God, he's telling the prophet, God is telling you in this moment, you have to wait. I know the pandemic should have ended a long time ago. It should have. We all said it. We all don't don't make it seem like it's just me. We all said it. We all was like, like I said before, when the president said it's going to be over by April, a lot of us, like we thought in our mind, we said out loud, dummy, but in our minds, we was like, "Mm, probably right. We were all wrong. It's still here. And God is saying for all of us in this moment, you got to wait. Yep, you got to wait. You got to be patient. Yes, in a perilous time, you have to be patient. You have to wait. Lord, why? I don't want to wait. I don't want to wait. Get it over with. You're the God of everything. You could do everything. You could stop everything. So stop it now. God said, nope, you got to wait. You have to wait because I have something for you. And verse 4 mentioned it. It said, verse 4 in chapter 2 said, behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Our last point, uh, chapter 3, 17 through 19. Keep our, our last point, keep your joy regardless. 17, 19. The prophet, throughout the, the chapters, the prophet begins to talk and begins to explain. God begins to tell him what's going to happen in the future, and he begins to ease his emotions. Remember, when he started off in chapter 1, he was pissed. He was saying, God, why is this happening? Why are you doing this to me? Why is all this suffering? Why are they allowed to survive? And God responds to him and tells him, yeah, I'm going to deal with them, but they're going to rule over you at some point. And he says, wait a minute, Lord, how could you do this? And then God begins to talk about the woes, talks about all the evil things that evil people do and how he's going to punish them and eventually get to it and then the man of God starts to ease his tensions and he starts to explain and express himself in his poetry and he starts to begin to exhort and say how much he loves God and verse 17 he says though the fig tree may not blossom nor fruit on be on the vines though the labor of the olive may fail and the fields yield no food though the flock may be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls yet I will rejoice in the Lord I will joy in the God of my salvation the Lord God is my strength he will make me he will make my feet like deer's feet and he will make me walk on high hills. Verse 18, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. (laughs) All the turmoil and the pain, and yet Habakkuk realizes there's still has to be joy because there is still a God. He noted that once he started to lament, once he started to complain, once he cried out to God, God responds. 
And just from God's response, just from God's reckoning of his pain and of his trial, as he sees his people suffering, as he sees the racial oppression bearing down on him, as he sees this political structure falling apart at the seams, as he sees these relationships falling apart, as he sees everything going on in this situation, God responds and speaks. And in that moment, he knows that he serves a God. He knows he serves a God who loves him and that no matter what, I will keep my joy. I will keep my joy. If nothing else, I have joy. See, there's a difference between joy at versus joy in. See, we must have joy in our circumstances, not joy at our circumstances. Do you see the distinction? There's no joy at watching people suffer. But you can find joy in your suffering. Oh, that sounds crazy. Pastor Mike, stop it. What you talking about? We're going to have joy in suffering? In Joy in suffering? That sounds crazy. No, I don't want to have joy in suffering, but notice the text. Notice what God's manservant realizes. He realizes that God is saying, I have something greater before you. I have something greater. (laughs) Look at verse 13. You went forth, chapter 3, you went forth for the salvation of your people, for salvation with your anointed. He tells them Jesus is coming. I have an ultimate solution for the ultimate issue, the ultimate trauma that you're going through. I have a solution. Will you keep your joy? Or will you fall apart? Or will you see the walls crashing down on you? Will you see these circumstances and say, I've had enough? Will you experience the loss of a loved one and say, that's enough. I'm not going to suffer like this anymore. Will you begin to fall into a state of depression? Will you begin to think all hope is lost? I've been there. Moments where you're asking God, How long is this going to last? Why? Why do I have to suffer? And then God says, well, you got to wait. And you continue to see the turmoil. You continue to see the lack of respect, the distrust, the anger, the hatred. And you still ask God, but how long? And God tells you, but I've sent my son. To save you. This is a temporary circumstance. Psalm 30, verse 5. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy, joy comes in the morning. Joy comes in the morning. We have to keep our joy no matter what. We have been through some tough times. And family, if I'm honest with you, we're going to go through some tougher times. But God told Habakkuk, told his people then, he's telling us now that he has a solution. And that there can be joy. So my daughter uh, was... It was tough to hear that diagnosis that she had rickets. My wife and I asked, well, what did we do wrong? What could we have done to prevent that? Why are we still living in this perilous time? But we were reminded to keep our joy. And I'm thankful to report that she just got her lab work done yesterday or got the results back, and her numbers have almost tripled. And she's bearing weight on her legs now. She's even taking little steps with her walker. 
Joy, <laughs> you have to keep your joy no matter what. God ultimately has an answer. God can ultimately heal those who couldn't walk. He can deal with racial oppression. He can deal with the political quagmire. He can deal with your broken relationships. He can deal with the family members who hate you. He can deal with all of the issues. He can deal with your coworkers. He can deal with every issue that you're dealing with. It's nothing too big for God. But will you keep your joy? Will you put your trust in man? Didn't you do that with the coronavirus? Didn't you do that with racial oppression? Haven't you tried to do it in your relationship? Haven't you tried to do it with your spouse? Haven't you tried to do it with your neighbor? You've tried. Now try God. Because there is joy in serving God. And when you are in God... <laughs> You have a force field. You have a joy and a peace that passes all understanding. Every head is bowed and every eye is closed. Because I believe someone needs to know that God still loves you and that you can still have joy. I know it doesn't seem like it. What is there to be joyful about? What is there to enjoy about this Situation that we're in, still dealing with this pandemic. I don't even know if my kids can go to school. That's what someone's saying. I don't even know if she'll come back home. I don't even know if he'll pick up. But right now, I'm telling you, Jesus is calling, and he wants you. And so right now, if you're willing to give your life to Christ, if you're willing to grab hold of that internal joy, then wherever you are in your home, outside, in the car, wherever you are, if you want to give your life to Christ, then just raise your hand. Just raise your hand in acknowledgement of Jesus, your Lord, Jesus, your Savior. Everything else I'm going to say it, Holy Spirit. Everything else will fail you. God won't. No matter what, no matter what, God will give you joy. And so you've given your life to Christ. And just repeat after me. Say, Jesus, I want you as my Lord and Savior. Come into my life. Make me new. Change me on the inside out, and allow me to follow and walk with you. Father in heaven, we're so thankful and so grateful that you have reminded us that there is still a joy that we can grab hold of, that even in these perilous times, we will smile and thank the Lord because you have an ultimate answer when you sent your son Christ. And so, Father, recognize those who for the first time or maybe even for another time said that they are committing themselves completely to you and they're giving their lives to Christ. And recognize all of us as we serve you. And so, Father, we pray that you would continue to cleanse us on the inside out and continue to change our disposition. We want to be more like Christ in everything that we do. We want to have joy. And our hope is in you. And so we thank you. We love you. We give you all the praise, glory, and honor. We ask it in Jesus' name. Let everyone say amen and amen. Family, we're so excited that you've joined us and experienced worship with us. And there are some exciting things that you get to do now. You get to subscribe and share to our various social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. We want you to be a part of Philadelphia SDA Church. And another thing, any updates, anything exciting that we're doing as a church, we want you to know about it. So please go to our website at philadelphiasdachurch.org. And finally... 
This is amazing because our mission at Philadelphia is to impact, empower, and improve our community through Christ. And one of the ways we'd like you to join us is by giving. So go to AdventistGiving.org, type in San Antonio Philadelphia SDA Church and support us and support this ministry and be a part of this ministry. We're so glad that you've joined us. Have a great day. We look forward to seeing you soon. Let's make an impact. Thank you.